And I think for anyone who's learning about stashery for the first time, some of the buzzwords that pop up immediately is the word robot advisory, as you said, firstly. Mm. And I think a lot of people are possibly even at this point still not sure what that means. So how would you define it and apply it to Stashaway? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So robot advisor is a term, but we like to call ourselves digital wealth manager. And how you can view it is as simple as having a digital fund manager. So instead of going to invest your money with a unit trust agent who usually charges very, very high fees. All you have to do is download an app and then it will take you 15 minutes to sign up. You can deposit your money. You can monitor your investments. You can know what you're investing in and then you can withdraw all from using the same app. You don't have to fill up any forms or meet someone, go to a branch and do all those inconvenient things. So that's the experience. But what is StashAway's main value proposition besides being convenient and all that? I think StashAway is a very easy way to get started to invest because to invest, you really have three options. You either manage it yourself, you give it to someone else, or you combine the two. Some things you manage yourself, some things you give to someone else, someone like an expert, like a traditional fund manager or someone like StashAway. So if you have never invested, it's very, very daunting. So I think learning about investing through investing on a platform like StashAway is a really good way to begin. Firstly, because we invest your money outside of Malaysia, which is a huge plus. A lot of options out there focus just on investing in Malaysia. And through your EPF and through your other funds, you probably already have exposure. So investing outside of Malaysia is a way to learn about different markets. The second thing is that it really fits the part of your portfolio that sets you up for, for long term because there's different platforms and different ways of investing that you can do to make money in the short term. Things like buying stocks, cryptocurrencies, things like that, which you might dabble into as well. But StashWay really fits that long-term and foreign exposure that a lot of Malaysians just don't have access to. So the great thing is that coming back to our original question, like if you haven't heard about StashWay or robot, what is it? What, what's the use or what's the utility or the advantage of using StashWay? Is that experienced investors come to us as well, knowing how they want to use StashAway. So once they understand what we do, it's like, oh, okay, you take ETFs and you form portfolios. Okay. And these ETFs of different asset classes. Okay. And it's denominated in US dollars. Okay. So then they look at their current investments. Maybe they have a lot of real estate holdings or they have a lot of stocks that they manage themselves. Then they go, okay, I will use StashAway to complement what I have now. So it's not only for new investors, it's actually a lot of our clients are also experienced and savvy investors. And some of them are also in that high net worth category where they clearly know what they're doing with their money and they clearly have enough wealth. It's just that they have a particular use for StashAway. So that's all very interesting. I don't feel like StashAway is out of place. If you talk to whoever you talk to, it can suit whatever needs you have. So I think all in all, just to sum it up, it's just a very convenient platform to invest your money. There's a lot worse things in the world than that. And the things that you invest through StashAway would be these things called ETFs, which are actually mm. passive. So I wonder, robot advisory sounds more active and you're thinking about where to invest in, whereas there's ETFs, which you don't actually do anything about. How do they work together? Mm. So the term robo-advisor came from the US because that's where the first robo-advisors were founded. And the word robo-advice comes from the relationship that people would have with their financial advisor. So the financial advisor would tell you or guide you what to invest in. And what the early robo-advisors did was make you fill in some information and then they would then have some sort of logic that would guide you into what portfolios to use. Hence the word robo-advisor. It is not a digital wealth manager or robo-advisor. It's not a active fund manager where they trade high frequency investments on, on the stock exchange or, or really, really create a lot of trading activity. It is, it's actually more about just that advice part. We don't really trade too actively. We actually combine ETFs along with our investment framework. And ETFs are, like you said, predominantly passive, but we can put together ETF portfolios, which are passive for the most part, but do better by changing the asset allocation from time to time. And when we actually change it is when we look at where we are in the economic cycle and we feel that and what we interpret the data as showing us is that we are in a, now in a different part of the economic cycle, your asset allocation should change along with it. So that's what we have adapted those technologies and complemented with technologies that we ourselves have built, the investment framework. And by that, I think we serve our investors better, actually. Because imagine if you just held a static portfolio of ETFs, when the markets do well, you, you do well. And when markets don't do well, you don't do well. 
So the idea of having a digital wealth manager help you to do using an investment framework is to manage those severe ups and downs better. And that's what we've been able to do over the past three and a half years, and especially over the last year as well. There's actually not a lot you need to do, but when it's the right time to do something, we change your asset allocation for you and protect your portfolio or enhance your portfolio depending on where we are in the economic cycle. And I believe the investment framework you refer to is called the Economic Regime Based Asset Allocation or ERA and it's proprietary. So how did that come about? Because I believe you also rely on that in the Q4 2018 when there was a market correction. So you must have had it up to speed performing what you wanted it to even at the very start. Yeah, we actually launched with ERA enabled from day one. And ERA or as you mentioned, economic regime-based asset allocation is really the brainchild of our CIO, Freddie Lim. He's had over 20 years of investing experience for major institutions. And the thing that made him want to do this was the 2008 financial crisis, where he lost money in his professional investing, but he lost less than his peers or his competitors. But he was just still upset that he lost money. There should be a system that protects people from going through severe losses. So that's where ERA came about. ERA takes into account where we are in the economic cycle, risk management, and also things like forex movements to give you a portfolio that is best suited for where we are in the economic cycle. So for example, if we are in a recession, you want more bonds, you want more gold, you want more consumer staples and utilities and, and healthcare equities. And in good times, you want more cyclicals like we are in now with COVID being eradicated. We are in full-on cyclical mode where oil and gas companies, finance, consumer discretionary companies are coming back to life, emerging markets, tech doing very well. So that's what you want out of your portfolio. And that's what ERA is designed to do. It is a systemized way of, of investing. So actually, Freddie doesn't have to rely on his mood swings or a certain light bulb moment. He, he actually has programmed his thinking into a model. So whatever data it takes in, it can actually tell you whether you should stay invested or not. So that's the real value add. And no robo-advisor in the world has something like this or articulated, articulated as well as we do because the, the asset allocation for a lot of robo-advisors are fixed. They are static. And some of them have this fuzzy logic where they say like from time to time, we will change things. If we shake the teacup and the tea leaves fall a certain way and I blow the dandelion, we will change it. So when I read this stuff, their white paper, it doesn't really make that much sense. So I, I still don't understand sometimes how they choose to change their asset allocation. But at least we have something in-house and we articulate it to the point where it gives you value as a user. We are very clever and we have looked into the sea of data and we have determined for you each reoptimization is done in a way where we tell you the motivation why we are doing it and we tell you what we're selling and we tell you what we're going into. So I think that's very valuable. That's not something that a lot of fintech companies and a lot of robo-advisors have. So in terms of investment decisions, this is not what users need to be concerned about. When they log into the app, they just need to input their data and really just decide on their risk allocation. And you have a risk index of 6.5% to 36%. So how did Stashaway come up with this risk index? Hmm. So basically, it is low to high. So the way you interpret this risk index is to say there's a 1% chance of losing more than this amount in percentage terms. So 1% chance of losing more than 6.5 or 36% chance of losing more than that. So we have 12 portfolios between 6.5 to 36. And the reason why it is not higher than 36 or it's not lower than 6.5 is that if you go lower than 6.5, you really are not taking a lot of risk. And there's no point for a fund manager to charge any fees to just give you like, oh, give you 1% or give you like 2% or something like that. So that's why it's at around that level, 6.5%. And then as you add on risk, there are marginal decreasing returns. So at a certain point, adding on more risk does not give you positive return. And that's why we stop. And note that this 36% and this 6.5% is the potential downside. So we also want to protect that from being too high. You don't want something that's like, oh, this could go down 50% and like say it with a straight face and be okay with it. Like you don't ever want that portfolio to be yours. So we stop at a certain risk reward ratio and we offer quite a lot in between as well. There's 12 portfolios to choose from. So all people really need to ask themselves are a few basic questions. Like how long do I need to invest for? What am I investing for? They also can ask themselves, 
what risk appetite am I comfortable with? And with that, they can choose a portfolio for themselves or they can just use our goal-based investing feature for us to actually recommend and guide you to actually picking a portfolio. So it's all very intuitive. It's all very simple. And I just encourage people to, to use the app because you don't get charged fees until you deposit money. So you can just fiddle with it, read some of the articles, play with the goal-based investing feature and see if it's for you. And if you've really done all your research, then you can just put it in however much you need. So I'm intrigued by something you said earlier, which is the 1% chance of your portfolio dropping. How do you hmm. know that it would just be 1%? Because I mean that like, you get stock markets falling like in 2008, 50% in the tech bubble again, 20%. So how can you guarantee almost that 1%? Ah, so I think I need to clarify. So it's a 1% chance of losing more than the stated amount. So what we do with this metric called value at risk is to look at the amount of times that portfolio could fall that particular amount. If it does not very often fall more than 36%, then in the distribution of possibilities, it's a very slim event of actually happening. So it's a 1% chance of losing more than that amount. So it's not to say that markets can't go down 1%, 5%, 10% in a day. It's to say that it's very unlikely that your portfolio will fall more than 36% or more than 6.5%. So that is how it's set up because it's a probability model. And if you look back in time, only big occurrences like 08 or 2020 that really cause big swings in a portfolio like this. When we look at that, we are assured that these portfolios are set up for tough times. And even in the tough times, they survive and then they recover, which is exactly what it did last year. So that's how it's labeled, which is a different way, right? So why talk about risk? Why do you want to talk about the percentage of you potentially losing this amount of money? It's confusing and you talk about risk and talk about downside. We believe that if you don't talk about risk, then you won't be able to make the investment decision. So that's why we've labeled all our portfolios according to this risk index from 6.5 all the way to 36. And it's something people have to honestly ask themselves. Am I okay losing 36% potentially? Even if it's a 1% chance of losing it, you have to ask yourself, in a financial crisis, I could lose 36%. Am I okay with that? If not, that's fine. Going, You can much easily stomach something like 15%. Okay, so then you use portfolio in between, something more balanced. A lot of people say, I want to make the most amount of money humanly possible yesterday. But like that's just not how investing works. So... We have to be responsible about marketing and we obviously cannot and don't want to market returns because it's all theoretical. And why tell you about yesterday's returns? Because that's not that relevant to you. So what is constant is risk. So we tell you about risk. So during my research, one of the criticisms or questions that I found people had was just in the way that Stashaway categorizes risk. So they talked about how the highest is 36% and the most is 39% to US equity. And it seems to suggest as though Greater exposure to U.S. equity equals higher risk. So lower exposure means lower risk. Because if you look at the lowest risk allocation, like exposure to U.S. markets only in government and corporate bonds, you don't have U.S. equity. So how would you mm -hmm. explain to that? I would explain that risk is constant and it doesn't matter where you actually get exposed to this risk. Yes, if we want to introduce risk to the portfolio, we do look at the US because that market and those particular sectors that we've cho chosen are more volatile. So they have, the, have better potential gains and also potential losses. Another reason why the US is such a small portion in the highest risk portfolio is because we see risk to the US dollar. So because of that, we purposely reduce the exposure to US dollar to the US to US equities across the board. And that's why we have to find risk elsewhere, which is why in the higher risk portfolios, there's also this other ETF labeled KWEV, which is the Chinese ETF. Chinese ETFs, uh, especially the ones which are exposed to tech, plenty risky as well. It's just that I think the way people look at portfolios can be a bit superficial because they work on what they know. And what they know is that, okay, the US market is the most watched benchmark in the world. So maybe if there's less risk there or more risk there, it informs us something about the portfolio. But truthfully, at the end of the day, it's all just about risk. And whatever is in that portfolio plays, plays a role, either from a risk standpoint or a diversification standpoint, or to give you exposure to a particular sector, or to even protect the portfolio. One criticism we do get is that why in my most risky portfolio, there's gold. 
there's a protective asset. So the reason for that is that, like I said before, the US dollar is something that we foresee depreciating because we are printing, the US is printing uh, a lot of US dollars relative to other currencies, so it could depreciate. And what is a counter to that as another so-called neutral currency? It's gold. And from a risk-reward standpoint, if let's say I invested all your money into the S&P 500 and I give you 10%, okay? Let's just say I give you 10%. And then I invest your money into Stashaway and I also give you 10%. From a risk-reward standpoint, Stashaway is better because it achieved the same amount of returns at much less risk because they had they had gold in it, they had different diversification in it. So ultimately, the quality of your returns is judged based on risk. And you can't just say, I could have made more money doing something else because that's, first of all, the 2020 hindsight. And secondly, that is not commensurate with the amount of risk that has been taken if you theoretically invested your money elsewhere. So what we're after at the end of the day is risk reward. We're not just after, oh, potential rewards that if we go all in, we put it all on black. We put it all on red and we get the return. And if you get the return, you look like a hero. If you don't get the return, Stash Away is a terrible investment platform because it gives you potential gains, but potential losses, sorry. So that's why we are very, very careful with our investments. And that's why the composition of assets is the way it is. But it's fine. It's conversations like this. It is questions like that, criticisms like that, that really make people realize that investing is actually more complex than they might think. It's not just about, oh, I invested in this particular ETF. It looked amazing. If you did that and you want to get rich yesterday, you would have just invested in Bitcoin in 2018, Tesla in 2019, rubber gloves in 2020, Bitcoin again, GameStop, all the things that you would have jumped into the very hot stuff at that time and would have no idea why you're not making money. So investing is not gambling. And that's why we have managed to risk as such. And that's why we have portfolios like that with assets like that. I think we're doing a pretty decent job. Since inception, our returns range from 3.5% to 17% per annum. So imagine being invested in the most risky portfolio and getting 17% for multiple years. And, and that's what long-term investing looks like. You invest for many years and you get to realize good returns. So in different years, Different portfolios would have different performances. By the end of the day, we'll give you consistently good ones. We, we have shown that we can and we have weathered many a storm. So we feel like we're, the investment strategy, the investment philosophy is, is definitely on the right track. Because you've already said the kind of people you have on the platform range from quote unquote unsophisticated investors to those who really know how to invest. And one of the things people will say is, can I determine where all my investment is going? And you have said no. Do you think that's likely to change? I think investing can be risky. So I think for people who are very, very sophisticated with their money, they have much more skill and options on their hand. And what we are designing for here is that balance. Will stash away work for you in your investment portfolio or not? If it doesn't, that's fine because there are people who choose to trade themselves. I have friends who trade options, trade in Bitcoin, and they do a very good job, but they're glued to the screen and they're trading their own money. So they live and die by their own decision. And they have told me from time to time, it's just like, this may be something that I can do in terms of making my own money, but it may not be something I want to do because I need to spend a lot of time on the screen doing my thing. So as long as it's a set and forget kind of thing, stash way works for me in their words. And this comes from sophisticated investors. So for them to choose what they want to do, they can use other platforms. They can use other platforms to choose what they want to invest. But where we come in is that we already have portfolios for you to use to make a certain amount of money, taking a certain amount of risk. And we have Stashway Simple, which lets you manage your spare cash or your safety net or your idle cash. So we feel like we have done a decent job putting out portfolios on a platform that works for most people. If you want choice, if you truly want choice, then you have to live and die by your choices. But the thing is, if, if StashAway is the intermediary and you chose using StashAway and you lose money, then you're like, oh, StashAway should have known better, so on and so forth. If you want to make your own choice, you can do it outside of StashAway. You can use a broker to express your own investment philosophy, whether you want to trade, whether you want to buy different ETFs, whether you want to get exposure to, to different markets. So let us do a good job for you. And if you think you can do a better job, by all means, try investing on your own and see where Stashway fits your investing philosophy because you might still need it to complement your style. Maybe your style is, I'm very short-term. I do a lot of 
trading. So part of my investment portfolio, I want exposed to long-term investing and in a multi-asset portfolio like StashWay. There's all kinds of degrees of how you can utilize StashWay, right? It is a tool at the end of the day, and there's no one silver bullet that will free you from poverty, right? It's financial freedom and achieve through one platform. In your life, you probably need three, four, five financial platforms to reach all your needs. So pick and choose where you use StashAway and ultimately you'll be fine. So last year, StashAway produced a new offering, which is a StashAway Simple. Can you share a bit about mm -hmm. what that is? Yeah. So when we launched, we were offering those ETF portfolios so people could invest globally. But then we also felt like something more fundamental is for us to manage people's cash. And by cash, I mean the pile of money that they have that they don't want to put at risk, not the same way as you wanted to invest. So we used a tried and tested financial product called the Money Market Fund, and we branded it as Dashaway Simple because we wanted you to invest your spare cash in a very, very basic and quote-unquote simple way. We didn't want you to go to a bank and say, hi, I want a high yield savings account, only for them to say, oh, you have to put in a minimum fresh funds of 30,000. You have to make six transactions using this account every month. You have to then buy this in insurance plan. You have to then take out this credit card. It's basically a way for banks to cross sell you a product and so many products and products that you might not need and so many terms and conditions. So we didn't want that. So we wanted a way for people to get FD like rates, but without the lockups. So that's where Stash Way Simple comes in. Money market funds are not new. They are a massive asset class in Malaysia. They are around 20% of assets under management in the unit trust industry in Malaysia. It's just that normally it's marketed to corporates for corporates to manage the spare cash on their balance sheet. It's not really marketed to individuals, but individuals can buy anytime. It's just that there's a real difference between you being marketed something and choosing it versus following what the banks want you to do. So we took something as plain vanilla as a money market fund and we are popularizing it. So we still get questions like, how is this so good? I can get RFD returns, but it's not locked up. Is it PIDM insured? What is a money market fund? So we get a lot of basic questions from this and we're just glad we can put people onto a good thing because it's something that's so fundamental and it's just better than FDs because why lock your money up and risk not getting any return if you break it early? Yeah. 